<laughs> She's going to talk. Here's 50 bucks. <laughs> Go ahead, whatever you want. Okay, we'll on on this. So during this talk, I want you guys to ask lots of questions. So we, we, there's only a few slides here, so ask questions. This talk is going to be exploring how American Express achieved the status of the most trusted company in the U.S. according to the Panama Institute. Now, does anyone wonder how this was possible? You know, you? big money. Marketing. How is it possible? <laughs> <laughs> You're well, up every marketing time. is only a part of it. How many of you guys are familiar with some of the security issues that American Express has had over the past couple of years? Yeah, well, like all the band numbers or credit card pin numbers were compromised, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And yet they're, they're, yet they're considered the most trusted company in the U.S. But there's more to it than just business level marketing. There's also information security marketing here. Or more importantly, privacy marketing. Now, why would Rigor Express focus on privacy over information security? Why are we calling this a privacy brand versus a security brand? Because everybody's concerned about their personal information, their privacy, I mean, their identity. Is it different? People are a lot. What do you think? Yeah. Information security is more, is, is information security to most people concerns the business internal. When, it, when they're talking about privacy, they understand, oh, this is our stuff. Yeah, we're concerned about it. We can actually relate. But also, Jennifer is one of, the, one of our resident privacy experts. Isn't there a lot more laws a lot more definition around privacy than there is about security? Oh, yeah, definitely. Tell us about that. Oh, thanks. Um. <laughs> 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 20 minutes on the train about your family. Are you going to be on the train? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Um, there are other business federal privacy laws in 1972. We haven't had security laws that have been uh, that, that long. Um, I think there are older security laws. And there's been many more since then. Um, HIPAA doesn't apply to the annex, but that, that has a privacy component. A lot of uh, modern rules that we have to comply with have privacy components, even if they're, they're also about security. Exactly. So when I interviewed Larry Poneman, who led the research on this, on this uh, company, as well as a number of others, he said, if you have privacy, you've already got security. So it's easier to talk about privacy because that's what American Express's customers actually care about. They're not going to wonder, hey, is my credit card information secure? They want to know, is it private? So they can relate to that. Do you think it's just that it's assumed that it's secure? And if, they, if it's private, they assume, well, obviously, it's private because it's secure. But privacy has a more tangible sense to it. Today we're going to talk about some of the questions and some of the ideas that arose from the questions that AMX asks itself when working with its security function and how to come up with its identity of privacy as a brand value. Now here are some promises that American Express gets. When you look at this, what are some of the ideas that you get from just relating to the American Express? Experiential problems. Any ideas? Adventure. <laughs> Family. Security. Seriousness. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what that is. Yeah, his, <laughs> I think his privacy might have been violated. <laughs> well, I I think it's about the store. You're about to buy something. You're trying to he's, he's shopping. Oh yeah, online shopping. I think it's very focused. Yeah. So basically, American Express. My favorite, actually. He <laughs> 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 look like every day. Yeah, a little bit more hair. Uh, it promises a compelling buying uh, buying experience. If you cast Satan staring at the screen, <laughs> it promises you an amazing meal at an exotic restaurant that no one else can get into. It promises you it promises you a trip to the islands. Pretty sweet. But you can get this with any, with any, any other credit card, right? But, but, but here you can be a member. Yeah. Why is that important? Why is membership 
Exclusivity. Exclusivity. Is that what word? <laughs> Can you spell that? No. There's eyes in it. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the key things that identifies a, a company is a promise to give to their customers. This is America, American Express of all founders. We work hard every day to make American Express the world's most respected service brand. Now here they are talking about credit cards. What are they really talking about here? What are the values or experiences that this brand statement offers to customers? Well, what, is, what do you see in this uh, table? Respect and hard work, obviously service. You already talked about exclusivity and you know different uh, travel and whatnot. So they're basically saying to the person who has accomplish something, reach a certain goal in their life, they can expect respect and hard work from their American Express. The other idea is, what is the service brand that you see in this? It's a service brand. Concierge. Either they do, they provide a service to you. They, uh, you can feel special like everyone else can feel Exactly. So it's more than just having a credit card. Yeah. This credit card gives you access to the talents and intelligence of a network of professionals to enable you to have access to certain services no one else has access to. But it's only possible if you have a secure key behind it. Here's another promise. This is very appropriate for today is Valentine's Day. Thanks to American Express. I don't know my this. <laughs> you can take your wife or girlfriend. My deck. <laughs> and have an evening out. You'll know, remember while spending the evening out. That's a promise that many of the men and women here want to have. That draw us to, to, to that experience, that service. But apparently no other credit card can offer, at least not securely, or with privacy. Now here are the core business values I've pulled off of America Express's website. Everything revolves around the idea of the privacy. So why would customer commitment be important to American Express? Isn't privacy more important than customer commitment? It kind of goes hand in hand because they're <clears throat> they're committed to the customer, and in making sure that they're committed to customer service, private they're committed to keeping that customer's privacy intact at all times, twenty four seven. Okay, is there a dark side to that? And this, like the sound of I'll, I'll probably do this for for a part later on. What is the dark side of customer commitment? Is it that you might overlook the other things? And put like other avenues? Maybe only looking at the feedback of your customers rather than your future customers? As we'll see later on. So quality and also integrity. What two security things connect from these values? Integrity, accountability. Confidentiality is another one. Teamwork. Obviously, this the business group works together to deliver these services. This also links to the security team as part of that collaborative infrastructure to provide services. Respect for people. Also connects back to privacy. Because respect really is more important than customer commitment in some ways. Because you have to respect the customer's choice to make the wrong choice. But you're there to stop them from going sideways on it. Now, accountability. What are some security, <laughs> security dimensions that you could see connecting from this business brand to the security team? Say that maybe audit would be part of it. Any others? 
dimensions of security? Is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. We're going to, later on, we're going to be connecting all these values to what the, how the security team align with them. Okay. So what, what, you know, repeat the question. When it comes to personal accountability, yes. how do you think the security team responded to that business value? How, how do they connect to it? What are, what are some things that you, that you would see yourself doing at Lender that would, that would address this business value? So you would look at things such as um, the team accountability and the team individual accountability saying, here's our project, here's our milestones, we met those milestones, we met those deliverables. Um, so you look at that as a measure. In terms of measuring, are we specifically talking about Accountability for the team or measuring accountability across the firm? For the, for, the, for, the, for the team. Okay. Yeah. See, so I would look at those types of things. Here was our promise. Here was our commitment. We kept ourselves accountable. Follow through. We followed through. So how, how many of you guys knew that the American Express was one of the founding members of the PCI Standards Council? Only one person here knew that. As a person that has dealt with credit card engagements or security engagements in overall. What does that mean to Amex? What, what standards is it, are they under because of that privilege? Well, they're under the PCI standards, but they're also able to evolve the standards. They held it a higher standard since they're the ones that developed it? Or they, they're a current issuer. Yeah. They actually issue cards to merchants. They hold other merchants accountable. Yeah. So yes, in a very large extent, they are under a higher standard. Yeah. Now, how many of us here are familiar in some part to be to with uh, PCI DSS? A little. This is totally just not going into great detail, but there are three basic areas. There's data access. Control the access to data, be making sure that they act that the data, particularly cardholder data, is secured and restricted only for appropriate use. There's policies and procedures around them, looking at firewalls, security policies, remote access, etc. As you can tell, network security is also a big chunk of it. Now, as a former QSA, when I would do assessments, I wouldn't just look at these three major dimensions. <laughs> I'll also look at how they're implemented. Now, what do you think are some business factors that would influence the way these standards are implemented? Now, there was, there's a lot of individuals here that have done implementations and consulting. So what are some business issues that you see? Um, well, if it interrupts uh, business and, and workflow in general, then, you know, they'd be less apt to They'll be more resistant to implementing these controls and things like that, right? I would say so. Yeah. They look for mitigating control. If they if it's going to interrupt their business, and a lot of times mitigating controls are manual controls, which means human intervention, and human intervention is the biggest. So let's say that you've got two merchants. One deals with cupcakes. The other one's a jeweler. How do you? How would you see the implementations of these controls happening in these very two different businesses that are both under PCI? So they both have to do the, the very same things. Yeah. What are some major differences in the way they would do them? They have a level of sophistication. <clears throat> you know, some would be more. The budget. Assuming the volume of the sales process? is different, there's different. Well, levels. let's assume they both have the same volume. That's right. Right. So when I go into a, a cupcake store versus going into Tiffany, yeah. let's say that at that day they had the same level of business. It's a very different experience. So if Tiffany is not going to want me to be paying attention to the server that might be in a closet somewhere that the cupcake, the cupcake store wouldn't care less if they, if I could see the server in the closet. 
although I would, I, I, as a QSA, I would complain about that. But Tiffany would want me to be paying attention to their fancy displays or the, with the, with the great lights that would illuminate diamonds to the, to the size of the sun. It's a very different experience. So the controls have to adapt to the experience. The same goes for American Express. This is a graphic taken from the Panama Institute report reflecting things that their customers really cared about in terms of privacy. There are three, the three top things are security <coughs> protections. Of course, you can't have privacy without security. No data sharing and the ability to be forgotten. Now, what, what does that mean? That means you don't remember what the social engineer looked like. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to the static locations? Right. Yeah. Oh, no, no, they stay on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> now, a little bit of clarification for this one. I, I have to ask what Larry about that one. Does your customer want to be forgotten? No, they don't want to be forgotten. So they're really concerned about mm -hmm. the company is Losing in touch, seeing them only as a account versus a person. So they, they don't want to be forgotten. So they're really concerned about that. Biosecurity security is more important. But what's really important is a customer's experience. So no matter what, American Express is, is worries about what here. So far, what have we really talked about? Customer and the, the customer's experience with that card. Well, American Express had some really antiquated processes and in, in te technology that got in the way of them the delivering that promise. We had a lot, had a lot of data, data management systems that were from the mid '90s. They weren't able to respond quickly enough. They weren't able to analyze certain fraud events that were causing them to lose money, as well as customers. So they did a whole revamp of their infrastructure, as well as process. During this uh, time, they also identified certain business files. Now, rather than trying to eliminate them right away, they wanted to understand what, why the files existed. So they had each business or functional unit create a video bio of why they exist. <laughs> and they would share these during during lunches. They would actually show their movie, say, hey, here's what we do, here's why we exist. No one got criticized for being a silent. They just simply told their story. So when people began to understand how that Business or functional unit contributes to the business and why they might be a silent. And they began to share information because they started to understand each other. So the business itself began to slowly dissolve the borders between silos. And new relationships based on delivering that brand began, began to form. But certain silos were very strong. We wouldn't go away. Particularly the styles around security. Now, based on your experiences, what do you think would be the major silos that would not want to share information with information security? Marketing. Application development. IT. Right, we'll come back to that. IT. Yeah. Any others? So the, so the major silos that were resistant to ASA information security were operations, so IT operations, software development, so anything to do with the website, they don't want to even deal with security. Fraud investigations were afraid of security. They thought they were going to take their doubts away. Oh. Who wants to do that? Yeah. Even though they were very different skills. So if you recall back to the business dimensions, here were here are the 
Infotech values that the Security Security team used. The security and integrity linked back to the related values in your business. Service culture. And I've discussed in my workshop before, information security is a service. So everything that the information security team did was delivered and discussed as a service. People would tell stories about how they contributed. They would use the clips of their video to share with the different business and functional teams they would meet with to tell them the story of why they why they exist. So the idea that the, the leaders of that transformation had to make videos was brilliant because they now gave everyone a way to tell their story. We're stuck for people and personal accountability or retain those major values. But privacy was at the core. Alas, because of the files between software development, particularly the web front end, and security, starting around 2007, 2008, and as recently as last year, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities were present in various websites operated by Amex. But last year they found an admin administrative console. That was injectable. So the first half of this simply created trending, trending information of what customers would visit the website. So they, they can customize cookies and ads to those customers. Well, over here was a list of hashes for the cookies. And the great part is this cookie is secure. Ensure that you're an HTTPS. Uh, it's being delivered, it's being shown to the people. <laughs> so, it got better. This vulnerability allowed a attacker to inject hash values into this. So they would actually be able to control the way that this, this admin console worked. So could you inject, these cookies are being delivered to individual Customers. Yes, you can actually inject. You could use this together with the cross-site scripting vulnerability to actually affect. Well, if I know Stephen Fox was logging in, and I saw Stephen Fox, I could inject cookies, leverage cross-site scripting, deliver anything I want. Yes. Into your secure. Well, secure session. Session. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And hide that ten thousand uh, dollar purchase. That's right. Uh, you I really think this part was totally harmless. It was just it was trying to get from each. Yeah. It was the right-hand side <clears> that was dangerous. Now, why do you think this was up for almost six months? Silos. Oh, it was better than that. Call center. What? Call center. <laughs> <laughs> well, they figured out. Hmm. Why? The call center? Seriously. They only focused on customer-focused scripts. When people would call in, if you were a customer, they would hang, they would essentially hang up on you. They don't want to talk to you. Well, you're not a customer. Sorry, we don't have time for you. Security researchers were calling Amex saying, "Look, there's a serious flaw with you guys." <laughs> Thank you. Oh, are you a customer? Does that matter? Yeah. Or if you were a customer. Yeah, well, we don't have anything for that. Oh, you, so you're fine. Thank you. Do you think that one of the researchers, though, could have just stolen someone's customer? I am Stephen Fox. <laughs> <laughs> Here's yeah, my, my address. Is, <laughs> my cookie is. Well, oatmeal. that would make you culpable, actually. Uh, no, we didn't do that. So do you think that these customers really got the brand? We've already discussed that link. No. No, the customers got the brand. Because nobody else did. Yeah. Because if you weren't a customer, they got rid of you. Oh, it goes back to what Jen was saying about incentives. Right? In your Moscow talk, that they're incentivized to have more calls for as many customers as possible. 
and abuse that they don't make. They don't. Yeah. They, they're very selective. That's yeah. the first thing they look for. Is this, are you a customer? If you're not, yeah. it doesn't matter if the world's on fire. Okay. Okay. So when I was doing research for this, the, for this extra truck, I actually found an article where someone had took took the or taken the, the uh, Twitter conversation between himself and a, a call center rep. Where the call, the rep was actually asking for the details of the vulnerability to be posted on Twitter, <laughs> and the, the the researcher was saying, "No, that's not a good idea. We're on Twitter. I want to see this. Is there is there a number I can call? Are you a customer? Doesn't matter. Well, if you insist, call this number. So the the researcher did. It took him three hours." to go through to somebody that will listen to This was after a number of months of trying to get them to be aware of this vulnerability. It's closed now, finally, because they retrained, partially because they, re they retrained the, 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 the callers, but also because of the persistence of several researchers. <laughs> no, they'll even cancel if them. Get somebody, even if you are a legitimate customer, how are you going to get through their scripts to somebody that tells them there's there's websites broken? The problem is you need to get a contact that's outside the call center yeah. that has some influence or possibility of getting to yeah. security. Yeah. Because there's social engineer on that research. Yeah, no doubt. Not a question. Doc, doc, doc. I'm probably jumping ahead, but has, the, has the AMX addressed this issue? Do they have a hotline for security team members? Well, they, they did better. They retrained the call centers. Okay. So every call center person was put through a new training program. They focused on collaborative problem solving. What that really means is the scripts are thrown out. They would train the people on the overall business units or functional units at the company and give them a list of phone numbers with sector level help, help desk people. They could, they could call on a, on a separate screen and ask them for assistance on certain issues. So if a customer called with a vulnerability, they could, they could tap right into someone in the information security team and say, hey, we got a caller describing this. Could you guys validate that this vulnerability is there? So out went all the scripted customer only discussions, they were, or rather the scripts, and now a more collaborative environment was introduced into the call center culture. Also, they changed their performance metrics to focus on the quality of the call experience rather than number of calls and calls. That's key, I'm sure. Yeah, right. Yeah. So at the end of each call, the, the call center person would ask, are you satisfied? And that would actually measure the performance versus number of calls. So they, by changing the way that their performance was being measured, it changed their behavior. And this is a, uh, obviously it's not a direct screenshot from Amex, but it's the, the idea of having a separate screen with a telepresence with someone they could talk to about the issue and inform the proper players in the organization about something right away instead of going through this protracted process. So the result of this was approved communication between all the other areas that would have connection to public inputs, a 50% reduction in the call center attrition. So before this, you would have a loss of individuals or people who were very skilled at what they did, but found better jobs, either outside of AMX or within AMX. Maybe they knew how to solve issues, they got, got promoted. Also, the employees at the call center were actually empowered to solve problems on behalf of the people calling rather than deferring to other areas. And through this process, silos were finally 
destroyed. Because the developers were embarrassed, they figured out that they, would, they had made a mistake and that information security really was there to help. But it took something really bad to come to their attention to dissolve the, the files. And that break in before you get started. Sure. Can you go back a couple slides? Sure. One more. One more. Okay, keep going. Yeah. Right there. Perfect. Thank you. So I get that the call center was retrained, the folks in the brand in collaborative problems. Yeah. I, I see what you're saying about part of the problem was someone would call, Len calls them, hey, I just hacked your site. You guys got a big problem.
there are other people that were also, also trained to recognize social injuries. Nice. So this this is similar. That was also that was my follow up question, right? Because all right, yeah. Oh, if I'm trying to go to some generic company, I'm getting stopped because I'm not a customer. So that's one thing. So now I'm able to get past you to Derek, who's you know one eye on Twitter, one eye on RC. He's like, yeah, yeah you want to uh, pass your list. Yeah, <laughs> password one. <laughs> that's why you're that's all my passwords, no, by the way. way. I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is, <laughs> in a way that introduces nobody's password. New risks, right? Not only of customer service and security function, but also of them divulging information. I always hear the new opportunity. The new opportunity to serve serve future customers. Yeah, most definitely. So this was the this is the security brand that was evolved. This is also off their website. So what does this brand tell you about the team? Particularly this area here. They aren't just worried about safety. They're also worried about usability. So, so if I'm one of the other, one of the other business units, this, this says uh, information security, at least on their, their slogan, um, says they are not going to get in my way. Yes, which is huge. Yeah. So this brand is used for both public facing but also internal. Because our customers are both on the inside of the room. Form for no. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Don't talk about us like that. Okay. I have hands for it as well. It's pretty good. It's, um, hands so we make a longer. More rewarding protection. I have a hand. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> I have a <more> hand. <laughs> of our brand. How does it get in our way of 
delivery of security guy. You're drawn to the dark side. Mm -hmm. Damn cookies. Yeah. Firefox. <laughs> I mean, that actually is. Um, I went to, so I went and I, um, what the, it was, uh, I bought a new phone and I, before I had uh, version wireless. And I was I was calling to actually to try to, uh, to cancel my account. I mean, I really couldn't get a hold of anyone. I mean, it was just a matter of, it was just a nightmare actually trying to get a hold of a person that you can call. They don't want you to cancel. I know, but it's just to get a hold of a person. So it was like, I, I would call and uh, from a, re a regular phone, and they're like, sorry, you know, I'm not going to take your call because you're not calling from your, like, your phone that you have with them. Oh, so they, be wow, so they basically, when they, oh. it was messed up. It was, it was a nightmare. But, uh, so I can, I can definitely see how other companies are actually stopping people from calling in if you're not a customer there. Sure. We had the same thing with PayPal. Like I got the number from PayPal calling that's registered an account. I've got all the account information. I don't have the password. Well, you have to log in with the password to get <laughs> to get the number to call. I, I, I don't have that. <laughs> I agree with you. Said, all right, well, what, what's the credit okay. card attached to it? We can reset that. I, so I can't log in to the credit card attached to it. And I have the credit card. And, and so what I'm just doing was canceling the account. That was the only way to do it. So the last four. Last observation is that here, brand was used to dissolve silence. So instead of a, a group of managers just saying, hey, you guys have to get along, it was an organic process that happened over time. Thanks to these stories that were enabled by the videos. It gave people, people within the different organizational units of American Express to really understand how they work together and where they really needed to share information, but also where they didn't. Yeah. So they were able to retain their own team cultures and feel like they were still their, their own teams. So was the first step the different silos engaging each other? Right. Is that what you're Well, the first step was everyone telling the story. Yeah, and that's what I mean, really, though. Yeah. Like, you're engaging, you're showing who you are, and, right. uh, you know, and what do you do? Once everyone realized that, it's like, wow, you know something I need to know. Well, here, I have something that you can use. Yeah. Or we've done this and you've done that. I like what you're doing. Right. So everyone began to realize that they're all playing for the same team yeah. and sharing sure. information. That's a good question. Sure. Was the call, were the call centers actually taking part in this, or was the, the videos internally and sharing messages just with everyone that's actually in corporate versus? Everyone. Every single functional unit as well as uh, business unit was part of this process going to call centers. But it wasn't until this, these vulnerabilities, when they're trying to figure out what, what the root cause was. They knew there was a silo between IT security, but they were hoping it would resolve itself. Right. But when this vulnerability came to their attention, especially that, that, that the, the cross-site the, the cross scripting, they, 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 they knew about that for years. But it wasn't really impactful. It didn't really violate PCI that much, and it didn't cause too much problems with the brand. It wasn't until the admin console, together with the cross-site scripting, that really worried them. Wait a minute. They knew about the cross-site scripting. For a long time. So, so 2008. Who knew about it? I mean, I'm not going to respect it. Yeah, but who was in the security team yep. or the development team? Uh, the, the security team. Did the development team? They knew about it, and someone said, I'm going to accept that risk. There was no incentive for them to do anything besides add and handle. Or no one said anything. It was perceived as low risk. I tell people all the time, and they don't ever listen. To uh, they can't do anything. Just now, how long did this process take? Of becoming aware, you know, from the time that it's... Oh, from, from all this stuff, about four years. For a company that size, that's pretty fast. Yeah. I want to go to that cross-head scripting that would be classified as low risk. It's discovered on AMX, right on the website. How is the software development unit and the security unit collaborating today to address this? I am happy to get back to you on that. Okay. That was a, I see they waited four years for this. There's a big fire, then I fixed it, and I returned the comments. I get all that. But if 
if there's still issues in the software development well, the, cycle that are not being caught. The process scripting right? issue is, is gone now, as well as the well, all, all the vulnerabilities that led up to this point have been addressed. The vulnerabilities that led up to this point have been addressed at that point. Correct. They're still developing the content, which they are. Which there could be new issues. Yeah. yeah. So I'll, 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 I'll have to get back to you on that. The same thing? Yeah. I'd be very interested to know was there any developmental changes um, either within their own SDLC? I would hope so, but I don't want to speak without confirming it. Okay. And how are they not, are they, did that also change their risk range? Because you said, okay, it's a low risk over the five years. And I know that was a Well, I, I, I do know that after the issues were resolved, there were, there was increased communication between the, the security team and the software development team. So I think that the walls between them were starting to go away and the processes were put in place. But What's really happening now, I have no idea. Yeah, because with, with something like that, you need to catch it in the beginning and you're allowed to do it. Oh, yeah. And it's <coughs> scanning for it. Um, and prioritizing. That's another question is... Vulnerability management? Yes. And actually, you know, a couple... <laughs> <laughs> These two units... Apparently, what is the reporting structure? I mean, do they both report up to a CIO, CTO? Or is it a different change? One of the risk management officer? One of the IT security team report up to the CIO. Okay. And then that's shared with the CISO and the upper board. I'm not sure what the reporting chain is for software development. Okay. They have a manager. So I saw their I saw his profile right there. That'd be something else I'd be interested in. Yeah. Does that mean, are you at the C level? A common reporting structure. Now that they're engaged, we can report up. Hey, fix this and put back down. Right. So that was a great question. I will give me a few, uh, give me a couple weeks to get back to that. Well, that's it for the presentation. Uh, you guys know my Twitter address. That's my email address. I will be doing a workshop covering the skills for this. I did a workshop over over at uh, Eastern Michigan. You can tell about it. Uh, I'm looking at probably like like June timeframe over at Walsh College. Oh, cool! So it'll be free. So if you guys want to actually get and do the guts about my recommendations, I, I actually do this step by step. I'd be happy to uh, have you guys show up. It's a lot of fun. Great conversation. Great way to spend a Saturday. Mm -hmm. I'll bring donuts. <laughs> <laughs> and if Jennifer has time, she'll, she'll, be, she'll be one of the clients. She'll be uh, acting as one of the clients. She did a great job of acting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 promise you. <laughs> Remember, she did the Moscow rules. You don't want to piss her off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did. And, and this is one of those clients. Yeah. <laughs> I kept going, are we, are we in character? Are we out of character? <laughs> <laughs> So, so any other questions about <laughs> any other American